Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm UEA welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Professor Claire Jowett. I'm Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. And uh, one of the best things that colleagues get to do uh, here at UEA is introduce another colleague for their inaugural lecture. And Sue Holmes was appointed as reader in TV studies at UEA in 2007. During her time here, she's developed TV studies, uh, that side of the curriculum in the School of Art, Media and American Studies, and she mainly teaches television and popular culture. For her first seven to eight years at UEA, Sue's research focused on areas such as celebrity culture, British TV history, and popular television, uh, British television cultures with work on programmes and themes such as Celebrity Big Brother, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, preschool programming, and early British TV culture. From 2014, Sue significantly shifted her research focus to media representations of eating disorders, specifically from a feminist perspective. In noticing how well the feminist literature lent itself to such media representations, for her example, her first case study was of the late British singer Lena Zavaroni, um, Sue began to wonder about the implications of these approaches for eating disorder treatments. Although this might have seemed strange for a scholar of television and popular culture, Sue rapidly moved into what is conventionally demarcated as, quote, social science territory, i.e. her work on eating problems and how they should be treated. So her work is highly interdisciplinary uh, as part of the proud tradition of such work at UEA. Sue's work in this area has primarily involved exploring the extent to which questions of gender and of power are addressed in clinical contexts. Working from a feminist perspective, she's aimed to offer women with experience of an eating disorder a chance to speak back to treatments and the ways in which their bodies, their minds and their subjectivities may be pathologised. She's also interviewed health professionals working in eating disorder treatments, particularly in the Norfolk region. The engagement work stemming from this led to her receiving a UEA engagement award for her outstanding contribution to public and community engagement in 2016-17. Sue was appointed professor in 2018. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Sue Holmes to give her inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Claire, and um, thank you for coming today on this uh, rather unenticing, wet and dark Tuesday evening. Um, so in thinking about what to talk about today, as Claire sort of gestured just then, I was worried that you might come um, hoping for a kind of pleasant excursion into celebrity culture or sort of reality TV or quiz shows, uh, which I've written about for most of my career. Instead, you've got what are medically known as eating disorders, which I've been immersed in researching for the last six years, which I refer to as a shorthand as EDs in this talk. But actually, the more I thought about it, the more I kind of realised that there were actually connections between my approaches to these two very different subject matters, especially in terms of how I take uh, pleasure, strength and deep satisfaction from finding new ways to look at things which are always right under our noses. Um, so whilst with, for example, celebrity and sort of reality TV and quiz shows and so forth, um, I've enjoyed taking that which seems so everyday and so familiar and then rendering it strange through academic analyses. 
My work on eating problems has kind of involved looking at what I see as the total obvious, the glaring significance of gender in the context of eating disorder treatment, and then trying to understand why it's been seen as not there or unimportant or irrelevant to others. So the more I thought about it, the more there were actually sort of interconnections between my work on TV and popular culture and between my work on eating disorders. And I want to talk today um, about the contributions that I hope I've made to feminist work on EDs, but also as a broader theme to think about what it means to be a feminist in the academy or a feminist in what is often a very hostile disciplinary field. And I want to use this experience to kind of reflect on the ever present promise of interdisciplinarity, which sounds so fun when you say it and less so when you try and do it sometimes, um, and to kind of reflect on how journeying along with feminism can be both the most beautiful gift. So I kind of feel like I'm in this kind of in club that I'll never have to leave. Um, while at the same time, uh, sort of feminism can be a source of pain, burden, exclusion, and a means of being silenced and rejected and denied. As uh, Sarah Ahmed Bluntsley uh, sort of puts it in her book, Living a Feminist Life, feminism, it can be a strain. And I want to think about this strain today and what it means, as Ahmed also describes, to hold on to feminism, to fight under its name, to feel its ups and downs in its comings and goings, your ups and downs, your comings and goings. And I suppose then this talk is about what it is meant for me to hold on to feminism in the field of eating disorders, an arena which really resonates with me, kind of intellectually, politically, and personally. And I'm going to return in the talk to Ahmed's uh, very eloquent living a feminist life, sort of describing as it does, I think, the kind of effective as well as political experiences of what it means to inhabit this identity of a feminist, which is still not by any means ordinary or accepted everywhere. So as Claire mentioned in the introduction, um, I discovered academic work on EDs um, in my study leave of 2014, when with a background in stardom and celebrity studies and kind of not much else, I decided to do a discourse analysis of how the singer Lena Zavaroni was represented in the British popular press between the 1970s, when she became a child star, up until her untimely death in October 1999. Uh, sort of weighing just four stone, she died from a procedure which is the modern equivalent of a lobotomy, an intervention that was intended to cure her of her anorexia at the time. And, you know, sort of 1999 is not that long ago. This is not something from the 50s or the 60s or it's really not that long ago. Um, and as I'll go on to explore, feminist approaches to anorexia tend to refuse the idea of self-starvation as a kind of illness or pathology. And they see it as, as sort of fundamentally emerging from the parameters of normative and everyday femininity rather than aberrant femininity. And I was struck by how well the feminist approaches worked in analysing the media construction of this singer at that particular time. And it was particularly interesting to me that in terms of the British popular press, it was only when Zavaroni starved herself and gave up her career to effectively serve her new husband that her femininity was approved of. So actually the press seemed to prefer um, her being sort of reduced to this sort of domestic waif-like figure. And this kind of femininity was much more approved of than um, when she had everything going for her. She had her whole life, her sort of sexuality, her ambition, her career at her feet. And I just thought, how interesting that these approaches work so well to understand sort of cultural ideas about anorexia. And I thought it was strange um, because what struck me most of all at this point in my study leave in 2014 was why had I never, ever come across these approaches before? And here I was drawing on my own experience of a sort of 25 plus years of treatment for anorexia. Nobody in any context 
in any particular time period had spoken to me in any complex way about the relationship between self-starvation and cultural constructions of femininity. And it seemed so apparent to me in 2014 that if the feminist approaches could help explain the different interconnections between uh, sort of eating disorders and wider, cult sorry, wider cultural constructions of femininity, then surely they might have some vague relevance to what happens in clinical contexts. So about half of my work has looked at media representations of eating disorders from celebrity culture to the serial killer, our sort of Beverly Allock, who was actually diagnosed with anorexia during the time of her trial. I've looked at how young women uh, on YouTube construct videos that are called My Anorexia Story that are made up of selfies of their own bodies. And I've also looked at the not so hidden subtext in Frozen and the idea that it's been described and talked about as a kind of eating disorder film and, and has been received as such and talked about by people with experience of anorexia online. But today I'm mostly going to be talking about sort of treatment and clinical contexts and what it's meant to try to speak the languages of feminism within these spheres. So in asking what I thought was a very obvious question about treatment, thinking about gender, and we should bear in mind here that probably between 85 to 90 percent of people who are in inpatient treatment for anorexia are still girls and women. Um, I really had no idea of the challenge that I was making at the time. I think I just thought, well, this is really fun, this new area, there's bound to be some work out there looking at how gender is addressed in treatment, right? Because it just seems so obvious. Um, but there really wasn't. And I journeyed back to look at um, some of the origins of the feminist work, which began as part of second wave feminism in the 1970s. Um, and sort of what this feminist work has argued since at least the early 70s is that eating disorders are actively constituted by medical discourse. And they're defined as disordered in relation to a much wider history in which women's bodies and subjectivities and experiences have been pathologised. And this research and the subsequent feminist research on eating disorders has tended to resist seeing EDs as kind of individualised illnesses or pathologies and situates them, as I said earlier, very firmly on a sort of continuum of normative female embodiment. So, although the importance of the thin ideal has certainly been recognised by this work, we would be foolish to completely dismiss it. Feminist research has broadly argued that we, that sort of we may misunderstand the social factors here if we focus solely on the media, ideal, media idealisation of thinness, because that, for us, is really only one small part of the picture. It's not necessarily the main reason why these kind of problems develop. So feminist research has looked at in the context of, you know, sort of working with people with experience of eating problems. It's pretty much demonstrated that eating disorders may be a response to a range of gender inequalities, such as sexual harassment and abuse, uh, sort of restrictive gender binaries, constructions of female appetite and desire, the shifting roles of women in society since the second wave, and the intersecting impacts of class, race, and indeed sexuality. In this regard, a feminist work has argued that anorexia is not about looking thin, in as much as the body becomes a kind of canvas to play out both conformist and sort of resistive uh, sort of responses to broader gender inequality. So they've tried to complexify this idea that it's about looking thin. So authors such as uh, sort of Susie Allbark, Marilyn Lawrence, uh, Kim Chernin, Robin Saysam, um, were writing on eating disorders in the 70s and 80s, especially anorexia. And the really key thing here is that they were not just academics, they were also therapists who were actively trying out these approaches within their treatment context. So actually, what's really interesting is that the feminist approaches actually emerged from practice. They actually emerged from within sort of therapeutic context. 
But somewhere along the way, between then and now, they've become largely an academic pursuit, which is confined mainly, as far as I can see, to sort of discourse analyses in feminist-orientated journals. I often joke um, sort of with my friends along my corridor that after being rejected from about 90% of the leading ED journals, that I usually publish my work on eating problems in um, sort of journals that may as well be labelled um, sort of just for ladies or nice quality of things about women uh, for women or perhaps even better sort of tampons, tears and tiaras. Um, and I'm going to return to that question of sort of disciplinary hostility but the historical and contemporary reasons for this increasing marginalisation of the feminist approaches in eating problems I think is both um, sort of complex and indeed multifaceted. Um, I think it's fair to say that the current emphasis that is placed on kind of evidence-based treatment tends to favour very masculinist uh, sort of discourses of objectivity and sort of measurable scientific goals. And these type of discourses tend to prioritise the type of evidence that supports, for example, um, cognitive behavioural therapy. Yeah. It doesn't tend to support uh, the kind of research that I'm looking at. And in contrast, the feminist approaches have been overwhelmingly qualitative in terms of their evidence and highly discursive. And scholars and therapists, although I'm sure this still goes on, of course, in like individualised private practices, in terms of a sort of larger scale rolling out of treatment, um, it now seems to be largely confined to sort of discussions between feminist academics and perhaps some particularly enlightened feminist therapists. This also means that there's been little systemic discussion about the use and the success of feminist approaches in treatment over the last 30 years since these wonderful scholars were writing. And this is a context which then creates its own barrier because no one wants to come along and start trialling approaches with people who are seriously ill when they've got no evidence base. So it's kind of a bit of a vicious circle. The same bias, um, I would argue, um, has been seen in the leading eating disorder journals, which sit, I think it's fair to say, largely in the social sciences. So the International Journal of Eating Disorders, which is one of the leading journals in the field, began publishing way back in 1981. And in over 35 years of offering four, eight, and now 12 issues a year, there have been a total of three articles with feminism or feminist in the title, which actually is in many ways unbelievable that this is a problem which still today affects predominantly uh, sort of cisgendered girls and women. And yet out of all those thousands and thousands of articles, the word feminism or feminist occurs no more than three times. Similarly, the European Eating Disorders Review, which is partnered um, and supported by BEAT, our national ED charity, began in 1993, and it's published over 125 issues, which has yielded a total of over 1,000 articles. Of that number, again, it's only three, all of which are in fact book reviews of feminist books, which probably say don't read these books, have feminism or feminist in the title. And I think that's a useful uh, kind of aspect to include in this talk because it shows the scale of the problem. Imagine comparing those stats with, for example, searching a humanities journal. Yeah. But I didn't know about any of this at the time, back in 2014, so I happily marched on thinking how exciting this was all going to be. I'm going to investigate how and why uh, gender is looked at in the contemporary clinical context. Um, but I also wanted to do more than this. As much as I had found myself in the feminist work and sort of recognised how it spoke to my own background and my own experiences, I also at the start felt deeply ambivalent about this feminist research. And this is because it failed to ask, sort of particularly the earlier work, the actual participants to respond to the feminist conceptions of their problem. So what usually happened with quite a lot of qualitative feminist work, all of which I love, is that they would go off and interview people about their eating disorder or about their treatment, then they'd go back to their offices and then they'd analyse the importance of gender after the fact. 
And for me, that was a problem because I wanted to be given a chance to speak back to what I thought about these approaches. And I wanted to give other participants the same choice. So I wanted to find out about the scope of gender in treatment, but I also wanted to involve the participants in the evaluation and the discussion of these feminist approaches, which claim to speak for their subjectivities, their lives and their bodies. And it quickly became really clear to me in my first qualitative study back in 2015 um, that none of them had found that any of these uh, kind of issues that I've been talking about were actively addressed within their treatment contexts, even though they all saw them as relevant to why they had developed an eating problem. So as one participant with a history of anorexia explained, I had absolutely nothing related to anything other than the food that was on my plate in front of me and that I was going to eat. Nothing, nothing related to anything beyond your immediate environment. To be able to put me away from this bubble of the health services and to go, well, this is you as a young woman within the wider context of the world would have been great at the time. I think I would have responded to that. I would certainly have responded to that now. And this participant, which always uh, sticks in my mind, later went on to try and take her own life when her periods returned following some weight gain. It was only at this point that her therapist, who actually visited her in the ITU, asked her in a kind of stage whisper, do you think we need to talk about gender? Yeah. Another participant who I interviewed was told, just try not to notice images of bodies and you'll be fine. And although most participants in this first study were unfamiliar with the feminist approaches, a couple of them had come across work at university much like I did. But when they tried to raise these issues in treatment, they were told to either put the books away or were made to feel crazy, as if, as one participant said, it was just more madness coming from me. And one of them talked about how she'd found Susie Allbart's book on uh, kind of anorexia and she was so excited and she ran into therapy and she wanted to talk about it. She was told to put it away as though it was completely irrelevant to her own situation and context. And that's not ages ago, that's about six years ago. Another described her experience of reading, of reading Susan Bordeaux's uh, sort of amazing book, Unbearable Weight, which she had come across after the acute phase of her treatment for anorexia had passed. And she recalls how it felt like this changes everything. It was like a real light bulb moment. If anyone asked me, what was the moment that changed your life? It was sitting there reading this book. First I was shocked, then I was in tears. Then I reread it and it felt like someone had finally spoken from my side. And I love this quote and I think I use it in all of my papers about eating disorder research uh, because I suppose in some ways it speaks to me and my relationship with this literature. I think there's a sense in which the participants quote here really sums up Ahmed's point about clarity and she argues that when you do begin to put the pieces together it can feel magical. The wonder of the clicking moment when things that had previously been obscured make sense, when things fit into place. You blink and the world reappears. Clarity can feel magical. For some women, including me, um, it is feminism that appears to offer this heartbreaking and this sort of gut-wrenching experience of clarity, like nothing they or I have ever experienced before. And I thought I'd been a feminist for many, many years before 2014. I certainly hope I was. Um, I kind of taught about it. I wrote about it. I was interested in, you know, sort of feminist TV programmes. And I had done since my undergraduate days. But I think I did not know it or really feel it until I found this work. The wonder of the clicking moment when clarity is both magical and painful. And when you realise that you sort of yourself have been wronged and, and have been affected by gender inequalities. 
which is not to say that I only cared about feminism once I realised that it affected me, but it's, it's to say that I kind of sort of discovered the difference between understanding these things and feeling them. Since this time, I went on to look at the various ways in which, although gender is not explicitly covered in treatment, um, it actually perpetuates a very straight jacketed view of normative femininity, which has been said, of course, of medicine more widely. So Rebecca Lester has famously observed how eating disorder treatment models, as well as uh, kind of ideas of recovery, are structured around dominant standards of femininity, forcing women into a sort of corseted model of femininity, regardless of how tight the fit. But what fascinated me is there was, again, there was no research that actually spoke to the people who have experience of eating disorders and who'd actually been through treatment. It was all kind of sort of conceptual, sort of theoretical. Um, and I wanted to make some kind of intervention into this sphere. And I did this by analysing a particular strand of, um, I guess, warnings, you might say, in the context of eating disorder treatment, which is what I've called fertility warnings. So the idea that uh, kind of women, particularly those with anorexia, are kind of warned sort of within treatment that if they don't get better and they don't gain weight, then they may not be able to have children in the future. Yeah, that's that's a, a kind of not uncommon warning within the context of eating disorder treatment. And sort of one participant in my study on fertility warnings points out how incredibly damaging these assumptions can be. So she describes how I've always hated the formulation of the stereotypical girl and woman because of the idea of stay at home mums and having kids and everything like that. And because I didn't want that. And it was another thing feeding into the idea that something was wrong with me. I went through a big time of not wanting kids and I was ashamed of that fact. Because these expectations were everywhere, in treatment and mentioned by friends and family, I didn't want to talk about these feelings, even though they are probably one of the main reasons that I got ill in the first place. And I think what's really clear here is that it draws our attention to the fact this is not simply a case of omission, treatment not focusing on certain things. That's not what she's saying here. She's saying there were that there were aspects of treatment that actually made it worse because it kind of plugged into and spoke to the very reasons why she got ill in the first place. And I found that my participants, that all 24 of them, were incredibly critical of these fertility warnings in treatment. Um, and sort of more recently, I've been working on a qualitative study just earlier this year on the issue of trust in treatment. Effectively, to put it really bluntly, how in inpatient uh, sort of treatment, patients are not trusted and they may be stripped of many of their everyday rights, such as showering and toileting alone. And so sort of these punishments, as I call them in the study and as the participants call them, often lessen in exchange for sort of good behaviour and, of course, weight gain. Again, gender is really important here. It's only once you kind of acquiesce into a more passive, compliant and less challenging mode of femininity that you are likely to be set free. Some of my participants also talked a bit like with the fertility warnings about how some aspects of treatment unfortunately made them worse. So I had at least two participants who talked about the horrific experience of being watched naked, sat on the toilet and uh, kind of in the shower. These two women had sort of developed an eating disorder for reasons very much bound up with uh, sexual abuse. And they felt that not being able to have any control over their body and who was looking at their body, again, exacerbated and spoke to some of the reasons why they'd got ill in the first place. Um, so... For me, that's been a really revealing and indeed powerful study. Spurred on by all these findings, I wanted to consider issues of gender from the perspective of clinicians. I'd spoken to patients, but I kind of wanted to get a sense of, you know, training in the area and what people who were actually working in this field thought about these issues. Um, so I went and interviewed health professionals in all of the local services in Norwich and Norfolk, whether these were private or NHS. 
Um, to be fair, I did not find that all practitioners were utterly unaware of these issues, but rather I found that the variance between practitioners was absolutely massive. I also found that services further away from the NHS model of kind of evidence-based treatment were much more likely to be open to exploring these issues around culture and gender or sexuality. Um, but if people had knowledge of these approaches, this was because they had read about them in their own time, not as part of any standard training that they had received for working in eating disorder treatment. Plus, for some healthcare professionals, there was truly what Susan, sorry, what Susan Bordeaux has elsewhere called a complete blindness to the obvious. Um, and just to say before I use this quote, uh, sort of many of the people who work in eating disorder treatment are incredibly patient, kind and lovely people. This is not a critique of them, it's a critique of the structures within which they're trained. So one participant reflected on the following, this was a mental health nurse who was working in an NHS community setting. She said, we work generally with females, but I don't think we refer to it in a conscious way. I don't necessarily bring gender up. But I think it does come out in subtle ways, in terms of when they're talking about what they're doing to themselves, whether they're punching their chest because they don't like their breasts, or even when people kind of strap themselves so their chest looks flat. So these are all things that mark a progression towards womanhood that they're trying to step back from. It does make sense, but I suppose I've never really stopped to think about it, or think about it in terms of how I might approach it. And I kind of really valued this participant's honesty. And I think what we can see in this quote is the idea of something being so familiar and obvious that it is actually looked through. So she says, yeah, actually, now you mention it, my patients are nearly all women, but I, I don't think we actually refer to it. Um, and you can see her thinking that what is ordinarily overlooked or looked over suddenly appears striking. And you can see her in this interview sort of reflecting on this for the first time and struggling to make sense of why she's been overlooking it. It's also important to stress here that although much of the feminist work um, has focused on sort of cisgendered girls and women, the significance of gender in treatment is clearly no less relevant to male individuals or to gender minorities. It's simply, I. Uh, kind of I would argue that the cultural constructions at stake will be different. But what does really irritate me um, in terms of the recent discussion around both eating disorder research and indeed treatment um, is the emphasis on how we need to be putting most of our energies now into thinking about the experiences of men and boys in treatment. So treatment should obviously, of course, always be gender inclusive. But nobody, as far as I'm concerned, has ever asked, what about the girls, in the same way that has been repeatedly asked about male patients in the last five to eight years? Indeed, the suggestion in some academic work um, that males are poorly served in ED treatment context because, quote, treatment has been geared toward women, end quote, completely overlooks the fact that treatment has not been geared in this way. It takes no or sort of very little systematic account of the relationship between gender inequalities and femininities and eating disorders. So the discussion of sort of what about the boys may end up doing further violence to women in treatment by effacing their needs and their presence all the more. I, I think we should be asking what about everyone in treatment? But I find it incredibly frustrating that in doing so, it appears that we overlook the people that have actually been there all along. And so following this um, sort of research, I thought, right, well, I'm going to try it out in practice. Again, having absolutely no idea of the world that I was walking into. Um, and I was, I was uh, sort of lucky enough to get the chance to trial a new inpatient group at a local inpatient clinic, which predominantly treats anorexia. And I worked with the occupational therapist, uh, Sarah Drake, who's in health at UBA. The groups were based on 
feminist approaches to eating problems, and I wanted to see what would happen when we used them in practice, rather than with people who were kind of reflecting back on whether it would have been useful in their treatment. And it was over a series of weeks, and we looked at topics um, such as the role of society and culture in our sort of shaping eating disorders. So we talked about what often gets treated as culture here, and how do these uh, kind of ideas make them feel. And they talked a lot about how when people talk about culture or society in eating disorders, it always just gets reduced to the impact of the media or the importance of the thin ideal. And we kind of wanted to move away from that and talk more about their broader cultural experiences and indeed identities as young women. Then we looked at a week on uh, sort of gender and appetite, and this is um, some images of a famous meme on the internet, um, which is uh, images taken from stock uh, sort of photography banks. Um, and quite curiously, we found that there are many thousands of images on the internet of women laughing and eating broccoli and lettuce, and there are no such equivalents of men. So we spent a whole week analysing this week called Women Laughing at Salad, um, which is really quite a phenomenon that you should look up. Look how happy they are to be eating their broccoli and their, and their lettuce. Um, so that was a really interesting week. And then we moved on to bringing aspects of my work from media studies, and we looked at sort of gender and emotion and anger. And we asked questions like, to what extent are girls and women expected to regulate emotion and anger uh, sort of differently to men, and why? And we looked here at the character of Elsa and um, how she needed to be the sort of good girl or the perfect girl that everyone had always wanted her to be and the ways in which she must sort of repress her feelings and we talked about this as a sort of metaphor for female sexuality. Um, then we went on simply to reflect on the group so far. Um, weeks five to six we looked at reading the female body and we explored what the very thin or starved female body might be saying to culture and how it might be read. And we focused here on anorexia as a potential ambivalence toward uh, or form of resistance to normative ideals of femininity rather than simply a hyperconformity to them. And participants talked about their own experiences of their bodies here whilst they were in treatment. Then in sort of reading the female body too, we uh, sort of gave the participants stories from my earlier research where people talked about how gender and sexuality were kind of bound up with the reasons that they developed an eating disorder in the first place. And then we got the people in the clinic, the uh, sort of participants, to analyse these narratives and see if they could make sense of them or if they had any kind of connections with their own narratives. And then after this point, we kind of took it to a more, I guess, contemporary perspective. And we looked at uh, the sort of contemporary obsession, which has become even much larger since we were doing the groups, around healthy eating cultures and gender. And we asked questions such as, how does the exhortation of healthy eating and the cultural anxiety around the dangers of obesity impact people with an eating disorder? To what extent are media and public health messages about healthy living gendered and still tied to a very narrow range of body images? And we looked also um, at the rise of kind of athleisure wear, the idea that it's mainly been marketed towards women and not men, that you should be hanging around in like um, a pair of leggings or a top that sort of looks like you're just about to go off for a run at any point, even though you might not be. And we talked about how that's incredibly gendered, even though it's also aimed at men, but it is more aimed at women. Um, and then lastly, we did sort of reflections on the group and we talked about how we might use some of the stuff that we had learnt in the context of their recovery, which hopefully they were going to go on and experience after leaving the clinic. Um, and so participants were then interviewed by a separate researcher because it kind of didn't seem right that we would do groups and then go and say to them, what did you think of our group? So someone else did the interviewing for that. Um, and one of the things that came up quite quickly was how the group had challenged their ideas about what counts as culture and society in an eating disorder. So as one participant said, I think the group is about the deeper, more subtle factors that exist every single day since the day that you were born. 
that you're not really aware of. It's just what society thinks and everyone kind of adopts those kind of ideas without even knowing. So the groups have contributed to what I would, to what I would have considered as society and cultural factors before. So I think before I saw that as like the media and TV, sort of magazines, whereas now I kind of see culture more as the tiny little messages that you constantly get. So it certainly shifted their own idea of the things that might have contributed to their eating and their body distress. Um, now, to be sure, doing the group was um, the most difficult thing I've ever done as part of research. And it was actually nothing like I'd imagined it in my head, but I saw sort of finding feminism and, you know, sort of joining hands. No, no, it was nothing like that at all. It also raised more questions than it answered. And unlike my first study, it was really important to note, I think, <laughs> that the patients who were in the clinic at this time had absolutely no affiliations with feminism whatsoever. And we're very happy to make that very you know, sort of clear to me. Um, and I think this raises sort of questions about the cultural connotations of the word feminism. It always comes with a long history of semiotic baggage. Um, so there are sort of questions here, I think, about accessibility and how sort of perceptions of feminism may affect whether somebody finds this in any way useful in relation to their own experience of an eating disorder. So of that said, all of the participants felt that these kind of groups should be part of treatment. Uh, but we also learnt, quite interestingly, I think, how the more individualised sort of medical explanations of EDs actually had their own use value to the participants in the study. This was particularly so in comparison to the feminist approaches, which pretty much point the finger at society. So, for example, one participant said, I think at first I did just think, OK, maybe this ED is all down to me. And I always kind of dismissed the idea as, oh, society doesn't really play a part. But then as the groups went on, it's like, OK, maybe this society's norms are quite disordered. But then it's like, if society's norms are disordered, then I don't know, how am I meant to change kind of thing? So what she's getting at here is, although she didn't necessarily like being made to feel that the problem was in her brain, actually, a, a kind of, at least that might give you a feeling of control that you can help change yourself. Whereas once you turn the lens or the light on society, it's like, how am I meant to solve all these issues? Yeah, so that's kind of what she's responding to there. Um, I've since teamed up with academics from different disciplines, particularly med and social psychology, as well as the national ED charity BEAT, to develop a grant, finally, which would try and intervene in treatment practices and training on a larger scale, taking into account the relationships between eating disorders and the various vectors of cultural identity, gender, race, class, sexuality, disability. But due to disciplinary uh, sort of differences and indeed hostilities, this has been, I think it's fair to say, tremendously hard work. So even though research on eating problems claims to be interdisciplinary, the gatekeepers to funding, to key journal publication, are med and the social sciences. And they clearly see anything about the etiology or the treatment of eating disorders as kind of their turf. At least this has been my own experience. Uh, sort of my work um, is often not even reviewed by the ED journals. It sort of gets sent back to me before peer review with our sort of big question marks over scientific uh, sort of validity. And our painstaking ESRC application, which is the piece of writing that I'm probably most proud of in my career, didn't even reach the stage where we were invited to respond to peer reviews. And that could just be because it was no good. And I'm just using my inaugural here to have a moan about the unfairness of ESRC funding. But I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Um, one reviewer decided that it's a sort of methodology of 100 qualitative interviews and participant self-representations was just simply not scientific, end of story. Um, and all of them had concerns about the kind of humanities methods that we were using. Uh, the only time I've been published in one of the eating disorder journals was when I wrote with a male psychiatrist, as lovely as he was. And I think my favourite comment from a journal um, after I referred in 
brief passing to my own experience as part of a sort of reflective methodology was, quote, that if you've had an eating problem, you really shouldn't be writing about them. Um, so of that said, this is not all doom and gloom. It hasn't just been like a one-way um, street for me. Um, I've learned loads from doing this research, and I've learned a great deal from medicine and the social sciences. Um, I've learned so much about how to write up a sample or how to write about my approach to analysing data. And I kind of went back to the humanities going, gosh, you know, we're really not all that good at method. I think we should be a bit more specific. We should be a bit more rigorous. So it hasn't just been this kind of loathsome experience of me, you know, sort of banging on this big sort of cast iron door and not being let in. A lot of it's been like that. But I've also taken quite a lot from their research as well. Nor do I mean to imply that the people in the social sciences or med are this kind of homogenous, like, evil mass. Not at all. It's just the ways in which I've come into contact with these disciplines um, has been through things like funding and through journal articles. And these are the kind of impressions that I have received. Um, so I'm still learning to sort of justify and talk about and explain my methodologies in kind of new and exciting ways. And that is thanks to me leaving the humanities for a bit and sort of going off on a kind of disciplinary holiday. And that's also then fed through into my teaching. I'm much more hot on questions of method with my students. Um, so there's absolutely no doubt that I have benefited from this exchange, if we can call it an exchange, as a scholar. So interdisciplinary work is certainly no utopia. And in reflecting on this experience of what it is meant to hold on to and advocate for feminism in this sphere, I'm kind of drawn again to Ahmed and her description of feminism as, quote, how we learn about worlds when they do not accommodate us. Think of the kinds of experiences you have when you are not expected to be here, end quote. And I think what I'm getting at here is that the secure place that I thought that feminism had in the humanities, because like everyone's a feminism here, right? Uh, could not be found where I, I had chosen to work. This world did not in any shape or form accommodate me, and I've learned that I cannot make it accommodate me. Such rejection can feel violent, personal, and indeed physical, and it's a form of silencing, I would argue, in an area in which questions of voice, particularly female voice, are already so uh, sort of silenced and indeed pathologised. So it's a kind of irony that the very critique that we're making of eating disorder treatment is then kind of enforced by the disciplines and we're back in the same place that we started. Um, what I would say though is that actually I've mainly found the, the kind of hostility to be at an academic level. The sort of clinicians that I've spoken to and interviewed, the people that I've met at workshops and conferences, they're like, absolutely, come in, tell us about this group. We'd love to hear about it. So the actual clinicians themselves are not necessarily the ones who are hostile. It's more the people who sort of gatekeep the funding in the journals, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, I kind of remain hopeful that in terms of interdisciplinary work, we still have much to learn from each other about eating problems. And with the growth of focus on the medical humanities in recent years, maybe things are looking more hopeful. Although what I've been getting at here is that hierarchies very much still remain. I hope that there are sort of new ways forward as eating problems devastate lives and families and can endure for many years and indeed decades. So perhaps it can be suggested here in terms of this talk that sort of feminism is not simply a kind of analytical tool but also how we survive what we come up against, not just in our everyday lives, but in academia too. Perhaps one strategy is then to make this sort of whole resistance part of the analysis itself, which is kind of what I have tried to do today. Where at first I only saw hostility and sort of resistance, now I see the power of the feminist approaches to unmask that which is taken for granted, and the power to question medicine, which often takes so little account of the relationship between gender, inequality and power. The very rejection of the feminist approaches, I would argue, from journals, from funders, you know, stop, 
you can't go any further, don't speak, yeah? Speaks, I think, to this awesome power that the feminist approaches potentially have. And as much as it has been an incredibly challenging six years in changing my research focus quite completely, um, is something that I have never regretted, and I don't think I will ever regret. Speaking to the participants in my research has been harrowing, wonderful, and enlightening all at once. So to leave the last word um, to Sarah Ahmed, sort of no wonder feminism causes fear, because together we are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. That was, that was inspirational. Um, I'm, I'm Malcolm McLaughlin. I'm, I'm head of school. Um, absolutely delighted and honoured to be here uh, today uh, to, to give vote thanks to Sue. Um, I think uh, one of the most exciting and original feminist scholars of your generation, um, whose, whose work undoubtedly, I think the, the talk kind of makes the, the case for that, um, whose work has uh, absolute relevance uh, for, for our society today. Again, um, the, the talk provi provides the, the case for that. And I think as well, someone who, who has had the courage to do really daring interdisciplinary work. Uh, so uh, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a, a tough road, I think, as you, you've narrated here. And, um, uh, and, and I've, I've worked with you for the last few years, and I've, I've seen you on and off along that journey and, and tonight to see you reflect on that has, has been uh, inspirational because it is really difficult but, but so so valuable. But I also want to say as well you're just a fantastic colleague as well. Somebody I know who has, who has nurtured and mentored a number of, of colleagues in, in, in research and in teaching and who's an inspiration to, to, her, to her students as well, to your, to your students as well. So I hope everyone will, will join me in a warm round of applause for Professor Sue Holmes. And as is uh, customary on these occasions, uh, we have uh, a little time for, for questions from the floor. So uh, do we have a microphone as well? Oh, we have a microphone to hand as well, so it'll be orderly and... and that's very unusual for an event that I have anything to do with. But if, uh, if you would like to raise your hand, we can, we can uh, pick your question. Ah, over there in the corner. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. Um, without sort of overgeneralizing or anything like that, would you say that your research has come across a type of person perhaps that might be more vulnerable to this, to eating disorders and this kind of thing, especially considering that you were saying it comes from both hyper, uh, like trying to be completely within the standards and trying to be completely away from them? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think... I think when I put out a call for participants, I do find I get a lot of the very same social group. So I get, for example, a lot of young, white, heterosexual women who've struggled with anorexia. But I think one of the key things that the feminist work does is it tries to challenge the ways in which eating disorders are kind of commonly thought about. So I guess I've tried to engage those women in thinking about the implications of how the typical kind of anorexic is constructed. And we've kind of talked about, sort of debated that. Um, I think I found in most of my studies that it really is a sort of a bit like a ball of wool where so many strands of it are kind of sort of resistive and so many strands are conformist and they can be both at the same time. So I think what I've found from my research, which complements much of the feminist writing is that it's not like either or it's not sort of resistive or conformist but actually it can be everything at once and there's a really sort of complex axes of kind of gender and power that can be at work uh, there's a question here just at the front thank you how, how far do you uh, oh sorry thank you <laughs> 
how far do you think within the scope of the subjects that you've had available, uh, there is a difference between the, the environment and the background in which people have grown up. I'm saying this from a point of view that <clears throat> 30, 40 years ago, there was no, nothing like the obesity problem there is now. There was very little mention of femini feminism yeah. itself. And I just wonder whether they, that's a reflection of the change of the culture with time and conditions, uh, and how far that might affect current attitudes. Absolutely. Another really great question. Um, that's one of the things we tried to look at with the group. So when I was growing up, um, and when I became unwell at age 14, I was not living in this culture where there was a real obesity kind of epidemic or kind of scare. Um, people weren't, you know, sort of going to the gym every night. In fact, if you were doing that, you probably had anorexia, yeah? But nowadays, it's normal, it seems. Like, I think I'm probably one of my few friends that doesn't sort of go to the gym. So society has changed around eating disorders, and that's one of the things we try to look at with the group. What is it like for them now, sort of being told, it's not normal to go to the gym every day? Well, actually, my friend is. It's not normal to only eat, you know, raw foods or kind of healthy and clean, but my friends do. So we kind of talked very much about how, how much more difficult it is for them nowadays when society has got so much more of a focus on sort of body health and a real kind of anxiety about that. In terms of gender, yes. Um, in the group that I did, we had a massive mix of ages, right from 18 up to 66. Um, and they did have very different ideas about gender. So the sort of younger ones were more likely to have come across popular feminism on the internet or on television or through celebrities. Whereas to the uh, kind of older participants, that was much more alien. Um, but I wouldn't like to generalize because we found that in the group that we did at the clinic, even though there was a massive age range, um, they all had pretty similar ideas of feminism as being um, relatively alien, quite extreme, and not something that they wanted to associate themselves with. Whereas the people in my early studies were really, really into feminism. So I, I think it still depends on the individual, but what we hope to do with this research is we aim to take into account those kind of changing political contexts and to think about how they intersect with and impact upon people's experience of their eating disorder or indeed why they get one in the first place. question just here. Oh, I, I, and then another one there. Sorry, thank you. Hello. Um, I just wondered whether you thought about um, the, you, you talked about your groups and um, you obviously did a lot, a lot of research with them and wanted to know why it happened. Um, do you think that much of it was that it was secretive? Because I think that eating disorders is quite a secretive situation and how far does it have to go before people know and because I think it's something that people don't talk about. Sure. Um, I think, again, I've been most interested in kind of looking at how people with eating disorders are kind of perceived both mm. in wider culture mm. and in clinical settings. So the thing that I've been doing on trust that I mentioned briefly earlier, um, I was very interested in talking to them about um, within treatment, do you feel that you're seen as secretive and devious and sort of mm. manipulative? And they were like, yes, I can't even go to the toilet on my own, but I've never mm. urged in my life. Mm. So I guess I've been more interested in kind of looking at how do assumptions about what anorexics might be mm. like impact upon their own subjectivities? Because if you're told enough that you're devious and you're manipulative, mm. um, then you probably start practicing those behaviours. Mm. So mm. I guess I didn't talk to them so much about whether they were being secretive, although that certainly goes on within clinical contexts, but we talked more about how they think they're perceived, mm. how they think they're perceived mm. by the professionals and how that might contribute to sort of negative experiences yeah. in treatment. No, it doesn't quite answer your question, but that's kind of how I no, put it. No, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you.
Hello. Thank you very much for your great talk. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us how you first got in touch with the participants? Yeah, it was very simple, really. I, I was very fortunate um, to get in touch with <clears throat> Beat, who don't do so much now due to time constraints, but at the time, they have a research page where if you can prove that you've got ethics and all the necessary you know, sort of permissions, um, then they will advertise your study for you. And actually, since my first one a few years ago, now, of course, they just send them out on Twitter. And within about three days, you get all of your participants. So they'll actually put that out for you. Not, again, doing it so much now, I think just due to time, but it's been a brilliant resource. What I have found, though, is that through Beat, and this is probably something to do with Beat's own image, I tend to, again, get a, quite a specific sort of demographic, <laughs> usually young, white, heterosexual women who've experienced anorexia. So I've often used sort of university mailing lists and other sites to try and get a more diverse um, range of participants. I think there's another, yeah, thank you. Hello. I just wonder, do you, a bit of a separate question, but do you think of obesity as an eating disorder? Because I know there was a lot of, like, I know that mainly the conversation was about anorexia or restricted eating, but I just wondered, because that's, yeah. Quite There's a, a massive load of yeah. debate kind of around that now. It's, it, it's not something that I've written about myself, but I think um, a kind of debate continues to rage about what is defined as an eating disorder and what is not. So only relatively recently in the last few years has something like binge eating disorder appeared in the sort of DSMV. Um, so I think, again, like the feminist stuff, we would probably see the idea of obesity as a kind of medical construction and as a way of kind of um, sort of mapping out healthy bodies from kind of unhealthy and unacceptable bodies. Um, I think the feminist work is beginning to emerge in that area. There's now more attention to bulimia and sort of more attention to obesity. Um, but it's not an area that I've looked at in particular. But from what I've understood, um, kind of obesity isn't classed as an eating disorder. Binge eating disorder is, but not obesity. That's more of a kind of cultural hiding behind medical sort of definition that we kind of um, put upon people in this very particular cultural moment with all the kind of anxiety about obesity, particularly with children. Scanning the room. I think we have time. We have time for another question. Yeah, we do. Anyone else to speak? Maybe they're all from med and the social sciences, and they're keeping quiet. They'll, they'll, they'll call you afterwards. <laughs> In a corridor. <laughs> Can I ask you a uh, quick of question? Course, yeah. um, so it, it actually picks up on that point about diversity and about whether you think uh, sort of expanding this and, and a more and more di diverse group. Whether you, if you're sort of speculating about it. Um, whether you think that would begin to complicate what you're doing or reinforce certain aspects of, of, of the way you're conceptualising this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we got our wonderful ESRC yeah. on, <laughs> that's what we'd have done. So we very much wanted to move away from, not the rigid feminist focus, I think that's unfair, but the kind of quite sort of predominantly white and heterosexual focus of a lot of the earlier feminist work, which hasn't really caught up with culture as quickly as it might. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at men, women, at sort of gender minorities, and all of the different intersecting aspects of class, sexuality, uh, sort of gender identity, uh, age, uh, sort of disability. So the focus of the research going forward is to kind of put the feelers out and see how well these approaches work for a broader range of people. Um, so that's very much what we're trying to do, and that also reflects the broader range of people who are now being diagnosed with EDs and who are in treatment. But I guess the point in the, in the presentation where I was talking about um, sort of what about the boys is not, of course, to sort of deny other people. Mm. It was merely to point out that why are those questions being asked now when no one's asked them about the patient group that I'm looking at. But sort of going forward, we absolutely hope to look at that, and we're doing a welcome trust application at the moment. Hooray. Repurposing that grant. Good, glad to hear it. We, we do have time for, for one more question, I think, if, if anyone has got to... Well, that, that, that's all right. And uh, Oh, hang on, we've got one just there. I knew uh, this always happens in sessions like this. There's always somebody... Sorry. Thank you, Sue. I really enjoyed the, 
the talk. I'm, I'm uh, interested in, in the issue of gender identity in this. And you've been talking, kind of going between the term ED and anorexia, where some of your research or most of your research was located. I wonder how, how much this uh, would apply to people with uh, bulimia, especially the idea of binding one's breasts or the suicide attempt that came after the return of a period. Do, do uh, people working with bulimia suffer the same sort of, jeez, uh, I don't know how to put this without uh, stepping in the wrong direction, but is that a common attribute of bulimia, do you think? Um. I guess I say that even though with every study, I think about 90% of them, I've always advertised for all ED diagnoses. I never limit it. I always get about 90% of people who have experience of anorexia. So there's something interesting there about the over-representation of anorexia in both eating disorder work more generally and the feminist work in particular. Um, so I've had a very marginal number of people who don't identify as having been sort of diagnosed with anorexia. So I don't feel I've interviewed enough people in that regard to fully explain, but there has been some emerging feminist work. It's been quite late in the day, to be fair, on um, sort of bulimia. And I think you're right to point out that the cultural narratives and, and kind of experiences can be very different. So with bulimia, for example, your weight might not change. Um, whereas with anorexia, it's been, um, it's been seen as being all about the body. And I think that's one of the reasons that anorexia has been studied more, because it's so great kind of visually. You can think about what that body means sort of semiotically. Whereas if someone's body hasn't changed, much less easy to kind of read in a sort of cultural studies kind of way. Mm -hmm. So um, I would love to have interviewed more people with a diverse range of ED diagnosis, and again, that's what our new grant will hopefully do. Um, but at the moment, I'd say I've been interested in why people find it so much harder to come forward. And I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that anorexia, as much as it's seen as kind of horrific and sort of pathologized, it still plugs in to uh, very much admired qualities in women. So the ability to self-restrain, to be small, to not take up space. And I think it's almost easier for people to come out and admit that they've had anorexia where you self-starve compared to bulimia where it's more about, um, you know, sort of binging and kind of overeating in particular circumstances. So I guess I would say that I'm fascinated about how anorexia continues to be overrepresented because it's actually the least common eating disorder nowadays, but it's overrepresented mm -hmm. in research. Um, I hope to interview people with more sort of diverse diagnoses in my next study, if I ever get fun. <laughs> <laughs> you will. Thank you. Well, well great, great questions, folks. Uh, and, and Sue, I'm glad you finished your, your talk with a quote there, the word dangerous. And yeah. I think, you know, d dangerous research, is, disruptive research is dangerous research. I think this is disruptive research. It's challenging and it's really pushing um, the, the, the boundaries of our knowledge and challenging, challenging our disciplines uh, in the humanities, but also other disciplines too. So I think it's, it's just fantastic to... Uh, your, uh, w wonderful uh, to, to, to have you here at UEA doing Thank your you. work, and in, in my school in particular, I feel particularly blessed. So if, uh, if once again, if you could join me in round of applause for Professor Sue Holmes.